Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Avery McRae and here are today's top stories. We begin with the largest class action settlement in Canadian history. $40 billion is being given in compensation by the federal government to survivors and their families who were harmed by the First Nations Children and Family Services Program, with half of that money being used to reform the system from its discriminatory ways. For many, this is justice, and for others, it marks the next step in improving relations between Canada and Indigenous survivors of colonial practices. Adam Riley reports. It's a historic settlement and moment in Canadian history. Indigenous Services Minister Patty Haidu says the intentions are well-meaning, and she summed it all up as to how many are feeling. And I think it really highlights that... Uh no amount of compensation can make up for the traumas that First Nations children, families and communities have experienced. But this will begin the process of healing and it will support uh, families on that journey of healing. The settlement is broken down into two elements. Of the $40 billion, $20 is being allocated for the survivors and their families who were removed from their homes between April of 1991 and March of this year. The baseline of compensation starts at $40,000, which can then increase for those who suffered more as a result of the system. Lawyers involved in the litigation are hopeful that the money will be processed and distributed within the calendar year. Nishnabi Aski Nation Deputy Grand Chief Bobby Narcisse says paying out compensation is a delicate process and mistakes have been made in the past when providing someone with a large lump sum of money. We recognize that uh, by introducing this amount of money may be irresponsible and may even cause more trouble or deaths or to... Uh, to people who are in the child and family services system. And uh, so we want to ensure, we want to work with the families, we want to work with the uh, uh, individuals uh, within the Shinabiaski Nation and leadership, how best to distribute this. The remaining $20 billion will go towards reforming the discriminatory practices of the First Nations Child and Family Services Program over the course of five years. Several First Nations organizations were involved in the litigation at the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal, including the Anishinaabe Aski Nation, which acted as an intervener. Narcy says for the reforming aspect of the settlement, there has to be a NAN-specific component in addition to the input provided by the other First Nation organizations involved. So NAN has its own specific pathway forward in terms of negotiating uh, with Indigenous Services Canada, with the Crown, uh, in long-term services reform. Some reforms to the system include funding to support those who age out of the First Nations child welfare system and prevention services to build cultural strengths to help children and their families, which will be implemented as early as April of this year. Adam Riley, TBT News. And we'll have more on this story coming up a little later on in the news hour. The Thunder Bay Regional Health Sciences Centre has been dealing with some flooding issues after an accident involving the sprinkler system last night. The mishap occurred in a patient room on the C unit on the second floor. Eyewitnesses say the water could be seen running down the ceiling and walls of the floor below. A hospital spokesperson says the incident led to some minor water damage and he credits fast action and teamwork in dealing with the situation. As a precaution, patients in that area were moved to another part of the hospital. Crews are now on site working to clean up the water while a full assessment of the damage is completed in the next day or two. After that, the hospital will plan a safe return of patients to the impacted area. The City of Thunder Bay has released its proposed 2022 municipal budget, which acts as a starting point for City Council's detailed review. The draft budget included a 2.29% tax levy hike and major increases in capital spending. The City plans to collect $208 million from property taxpayers. That's $5 million more than last year. There's also a 3% hike to water rates, and the budget includes an expansion of 60.5 full-time jobs, with 75% being fully funded by the government, mainly for long-term care and EMS programs. The new police headquarters is contained in the budget, and City Manager Norm Gale spoke about the long-term impact of the $56 million project. And the full impact will be uh, seen in 2025 via a debenture, is what we're proposing um, for that project. There will be implications for 2023 and 2024 in the construction run-up costs for that as well. The estimated impact of COVID-19 this year is $7 million with that money coming from the Stabilization Reserve Fund. 
The long-term financial overview will be presented next Tuesday. The public pre-budget deputations are set for January 13th and Council's budget deliberations begin on January 18th. Meanwhile, a variety of city services are being impacted by new provincial COVID-19 restrictions laid out by Premier Doug Ford yesterday. Older adult centres, including the 55-plus centre and West Arthur Community Centre, will remain closed following the holiday break. The Thunder Bay Public Library branches have also closed to the public, but many services will still be available with the curbside format being used. Library staff will be on site offering free printing of COVID-19 vaccination records with QR codes. Also being affected are the Baggage Building Arts Centre and the Water Garden Pavilion, which will both remain closed. But good news, the skating rink at the marina will remain open to users. However, all indoor sports and recreation facilities are being closed as of midnight tonight. That includes all city arenas, volunteer pool, and the Canada Games complex. The closures will remain in place until at least January 26. Well, Ontario is reporting 11,352 new COVID-19 cases today, but health officials warn that case counts are now an underestimate due largely to the province's testing resources. And there's growing evidence of increased pressure on Ontario hospitals. This as parents make plans to return their kids to online learning this week. And businesses brace for new restrictions that come into effect at midnight. Colin DeMillo has the latest details. The Omicron variant is already starting to push hospitals to their limits. As of today, there are 1,290 people with COVID-19 in hospitals in Ontario. That's up 81% from this time last week, at a time when staff are already feeling burnt out. This is unprecedented times. We need to be cognizant of how nurses are feeling during this time. We are overworked. Some, some nurses working 16 hours or even longer days. The rising numbers coupled with dwindling staff has forced the William Osler Health System in the greater Toronto area to declare a code orange. That not only are we having a lot of patients that are coming in to seek care, but a lot of our staff and that staff, not only in healthcare, but in any walk of life, that are getting ill and having to stay home. Even for them to stay home with the new isolation period five, for five days becomes a real burden uh, on our healthcare system. The concerns over hospitals being overwhelmed led to a new wave of restrictions. The Ford government announced yesterday that bars and restaurants would be closed for indoor dining, while gyms will be shut down altogether, leaving business owners feeling deflated. We're followed every pandemic restriction you know, we're a business that's operating with a vaccine passport. We've got reduced capacity, social distancing in place, the use of masks when we're, we're not socially distanced. So you're left wondering as a small business owner is when am I going to be able to operate? It's not just the business owners, but millions of families that are being impacted as well. The Ford government is closing schools for in-person learning for at least two weeks and pivoting to remote learning instead. I do have to say that I'm this disheartened by this decision because I think we all know by now uh, and agree that in-person learning is essential to the med mental, physical and developmental well-being of children. While the government says it wants students to return to the classroom on January 17th, it has provided no guarantees. And school boards have already been told to prepare for the long term. One thing that the Ministry of Education has told all school boards that they should be considering rotating remote learning days. Uh, and that's something that we're looking at and all school boards are looking at to help cope with that staffing uh, concern. Leaving families in limbo about what the next few weeks will look like. The Thunder Bay District Health Unit is reporting another death related to COVID-19. It's the 72nd COVID-related death in the district since the pandemic began and the 6th since early December. The health unit is reporting 40 new cases today and the number of active cases has dropped to 350. 32 of the new cases are in the Thunder Bay area while eight reside in district communities. There are now 10 patients at the Regional Health Sciences Center with four more being admitted today with one patient now in the ICU. Meanwhile, a COVID outbreak has been declared in one section of the Southbridge Pinewood long-term care home on Wall Street and there's also a facility-wide outbreak at Southbridge Lakehead Manor. In other news, local vaccine rates continue to inch up. Over 87% of people aged 12 and up now have both doses, and nearly 50% of kids aged 5 to 11 have received one dose. 
Another 12,000 people got their booster shots as well over the past two weeks. New COVID case numbers also continue to come in from the Northwestern Health Unit, despite the move away from PCR testing for low-risk individuals. There were 42 new cases reported today in the NWHU catchment area. The number of active cases now sits at 418, up 8 from yesterday. 25 of the new cases are in the Sioux Lookout area, 15 are in Kenora, and there's one each in Dryden and Rainy River. Medical Officer of Health Dr. Kit Young-Hoon says the actual numbers are likely even higher due to the less accurate reporting. At this point, one of the issues we're dealing with is um, uh, the, the large number of cases that come in that have to be manually input into the system. Um, so we may not be capturing all uh, case numbers accurately um, at this point. And in general, um, I think it needs to be recognized that case numbers are no longer accurate. The NWHU currently has four cases in hospital, and Young Hoon says going forward, numbers for hospitalizations and the ICU admissions will be prioritized, as she believes Omicron will bring an increase to both. She also spoke today about the Ford government's decision to go back into step two of the provincial framework, and Young Hoon is hopeful the new measures will not be long term, but she supports the move until the severity of the Omicron variant can be better understood. And therefore, it is important to monitor the data in real time and therefore make decisions and, and pivot appropriately. Um, so to me, at this, at this point, I think that the, the actions um, are reasonable considering some of the data trends that, that are being noted. Thunder Bay's two MPPs are sounding off on the four governments handling of the latest surge of the pandemic. Tighter restrictions and online learning will be put in place across the province tomorrow, and both Liberal Michael Gravel and NDP Judith Monteith Farrell say the Premier dropped the ball leading up to this point. Jessica Clement reports. While well, the reaction to the restrictions around the province have been mixed, Thunder Bay Superior North MPP Michael Gravel says he's disappointed with how the Ford government has reacted to the Omicron wave, specifically pertaining to the education system. Last week they were telling us uh, the, the ch children will be back in schools on uh, January the 3rd, today on Monday the 3rd, then it was the 5th, and now it's two more weeks. So um, I do think that's, that's been handled very poorly. While the government is now taking action with having schools be online for the next two weeks, both Gravel and the NDP's Judith Monteith Farrell believe more precautions should have been taken long before Monday's announcement. So I, and I do believe that, that, that things could have been put in place so that schools could have been open, could have been proper ventilation put in place, could have been smaller class sizes, could have made sure that N95 masks were available to teachers. So I do think that's the real failing of this government. We've been asking for a plan to get that in place for now over, you know, over two months that, you know, vaccination should have been prioritized for education workers and students and really making the investment to make, ensure that kids can go to school. Along with the concerns regarding the school system, the politicians also want to see more widespread rapid testing for the public in the near future. Monteith Farrell says that it would bring peace of mind to all residents and hopefully help with the spread of the virus. To, you know, people are, you know, going online and Facebook and trying to find a rapid test to be confirmed and that shouldn't be that way. I really think that we need, people need to feel protected in these times, not like they're on their own and that's, I think, what this plan has done. Jessica Clement, TVT News. Well, it's a sad time for the Shoal Lake 39 First Nation and the Treaty 3 Police Service. A young boy who was recently inducted as the force's junior chief of police has passed away. Deanne Sidney Green passed away yesterday morning. The 12-year-old boy had battled three different forms of cancer during his short life. It was a long-time dream of his to become a police officer like his grandfather, Treaty 3 Constable Gary Tom. So in October, Deanne was given an honorary junior chief of police uniform and badge at a swearing-in ceremony for new officers. His mother Rachel says despite his terminal illness, he wore his badge with pride. He also got a chance last spring to have a virtual chat with his idol, Sidney Crosby. In honor of Deanne Green, all Treaty 3 police flags are being flown at half-mass. Well, now we're joined by Mitchell Ringos. Mitchell, it's very cold around all of northwestern Ontario, but on the glass.